Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cast Distillery Podcast, where we really unlock the potential of ServiceNow with expert insights and practical strategies only here on the Cast Distillery Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Dawson, client architect here at Cask, and with me, I've got Greg Aldana, and Greg is the Global Area Vice President for a Creator Workflow Solution and Consulting Organization at ServiceNow, where he manages a global team of more than 60 solution consultants who help customers to realize their digital transformation aspirations by solution impactful, low-code solutions with ServiceNow's App Engine. He has been with ServiceNow for about six and a half years, although he's been in the application development space for over 25 years. Greg describes himself, and this is my favorite part, as a baseball loving, vinyl collecting, rock and roll exec who gets to use his passion for storytelling at ServiceNow. And wow, look at that background, Greg. Thanks for joining (laughs) us. I mean, we could do a whole episode, I think, on your on your shelves and going. We'll do that on the next episode, Sean. We could do, well, we could I'll, do, I'll take you a little bit of a tour yeah, through the yeah. museum. Uh, do yeah, a little absolutely. office uh, office shelf road show, you know, like antiques yeah. road show, but but your shelves, it looks awesome, man. Love it. Thanks, man. Well, I, you know, I, I think I, I've mentioned to you in the past, right? What's the edict? Whoever has the most toys when they die <laughs> wins. Well, I'm way ahead of all of you. Yeah, you certainly are, man. There's a lot to talk about on there, but let's get into. Uh, App Engine. And what I wanted to do is talk a little bit first about ServiceNow with its roots in IT, because a lot of people in our listen, listeners, viewer, however you're watching this or consuming this, you know, everybody knows ServiceNow for IT, but why should customers trust ServiceNow for their app development, thinking about App Engine and, and, and what, what do you have to say about that? Sure. Well, well, thanks for having me, Sean. I yeah. really do appreciate being here. This is my favorite topic to talk about, and uh, <laughs> I could probably talk about it for hours. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, when most people hear ServiceNow, I think even when I told my friends and family, oh, I'm going to work for ServiceNow, they're like, why are you going to work for ServiceNow? You're a developer, and that is not the IT ticketing company, the IT help desk company. Mm-hmm. And what I don't think a lot of people realize is that ServiceNow was not originally created or designed as an IT help desk platform Mm -hmm. or an IT service management platform, even though that's what we're very famous for and what we're known as. You know, the original vision for when Fred Luddy, the the founder of ServiceNow, created ServiceNow back in 2004, I mean, this was a direct quote of his. I want to create a platform that will enable regular people, you know, the people in the mail room, you know, not the developers, to be able to create meaningful apps to move work around a company. That sounds a lot like low code citizen development to me. And this was back, you know, what, like almost 20 years ago, it'll be next year. Mm-hmm. And so ServiceNow was originally envisioned as a low code, high productivity app dev workflow platform. And literally ITSM was just the first low code app that was actually built on our platform. But you ask a great question, Sean, why should I use ServiceNow to develop apps? There, 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 yeah. There's hundreds of platforms out there and tools. Oh my like, God, it seems like every day there's more and more. And I think that our roots in IT service management, in IT asset management, IT operational management, we, we are the market leaders in managing your IT, right? Mm-hmm. That's exactly why we are the best choice to develop applications on our platform. Because not only do we give you the great tools that everybody has to build applications and workflows and integrations and all that good stuff, but we actually give you the technology and the paradigm to manage that. So you're not just building applications and servers. Now you're managing the building, you're managing the paradigm so that you can manage the governance behind it, the ideation, what I should be building. And then once I build an application, I can manage it as an asset the way I manage all of my other IT on service now. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really what separates us out and makes us one of the most powerful platforms in the industry to mm-hmm. actually build and manage your application development on. That totally makes sense. And uh, I don't know why, it kind of came up a, a pyramid, you know, we're building the foundation and ServiceNow has got all the layers all the way up to the management and visibility to the C-suite on what's going on. I love that analogy. That's, that's cool. Um, yeah. So when, you know, when you say app development, I feel like someone might think, you know, small single application for a specific niche or purpose, but you know, we, we know that you, this could be enterprise uh, where ServiceNow comes in with App Engine to transform large process and large procedures. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, is the simplicity, but also yet the complexity, I guess. I mean, absolutely. And and that's that's kind of a good way to kind of couch it, Sean, because I see very simple things, mm-hmm. 
that maybe citizen developers build on our platform, a simple request form app. Hey, I'm, you know, whatever I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to have people sign up for an event and it's yeah. a very simple app and I send out a form and people sign up and that's it, you know, and it maybe only lives for a couple of weeks when the event's over. And so we see things at that end of the, the spectrum where people are building very simple applications, but yet we see things all the way on the other end where we see governments creating financial crime investigation systems on mm -hmm. our platform. I saw this in the U S government when, uh, they were building applications to go and manage and investigate all the fraud that took place when the TARP funds were giving out. And there were bankers that uh, there was about, about $11 billion that was recovered and <laughs> hundreds of bankers went to jail. And they use ServiceNow to actually build the custom application to manage the investigations as a case. And then all the integrations and the workflows and the collection of evidence. So it was a very, very sophisticated system. I've seen technology companies who are actually taking in uh, data feeds from record companies every week using our integration hub and our automation engine technology to consolidate all of that information and then route it around their company for people to approve the lyrics and the, the icons and all the attributes of this music and then publish it into their, their mobile store for people to purchase it. So a, a, a mission critical revenue mm. generating uh, business um, uh, process that they're using ServiceNow's app engine to, to manage. Um, but all kinds of things, not just like back office or, you know, very technical things, but I'm seeing a lot of front facing forward, you know, almost humanitarian type missions. Mm. Um, probably one of the largest creator workflows and app engine customers that I've seen globally at ServiceNow is the U.S. State Department. Mm. I mean, you know, you know they, they've spoken at our knowledge conference a, a bunch of times. And I mean, just like literally using ServiceNow's app engine to automate every service you can imagine that a diplomat uses with it within an embassy. But mm. I'll give you a really great example of the importance, maybe not necessarily the complexity, but a large application when the US um, had to evacuate Afghanistan a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And also those pictures on the airport of people, oh my God, at the airport trying to get out. Well, they got notification about 10 days prior to that. Okay, we're pulling out. You're gonna get inundated with repatriation requests you better come up with a system to automate this and the acceptance of this. And what did they use? They use ServiceNow's app engine. And under a week, they built a, a public facing application to accept these requests for repatriations. And they built an wow. internal workflow to evaluate them. And they've been using this for a couple of years now to repatriate about 70,000 refugees back from Afghanistan back to the United States. So we're seeing this across the spectrum, very mm -hmm. simple kind of back end clerical event management type things very, you know, very um, mission critical investigations that are, you know, the workflow has to up, be upheld in court. And yet we're seeing it all the way to, you know, very humanitarian public things of, of, about getting, re you know, refugees from one country to another. So we're just really seeing the spectrum and a lot of variety in the, in the types of applications people are using App Engine to build. Awesome. I mean, that, there's such a big breadth of uh, really stuff that you're sharing with their and it makes me also think about, um, you know, we see clients that have challenges with maintaining apps from a governance perspective. When you think small and large, I start thinking, how are we managing that? So what advice would you give to those customers struggling with governance or even approaching it? Well, well I'm glad you asked that question because I, I kind of run into that on, on a weekly basis. So, I mean, as you know, I do a lot of traveling for service now, and I probably meet with about, I don't know, 200, 250 CIOs and, and business leaders and tech leaders, you know, every year. And every week I'm hearing about this, you know, mm. Greg, this sounds great. I've, I've, I've heard this promise before, you know, every few years in technology, there's a new platform and a new tool. It's going to change all of our lives. We get to build lots <laughs> yeah. of stuff really fast. And look, a lot of noise. we'll get to it. In, we'll, we'll get to it in a little bit, but with the, with the introduction of Gen AI into this, you know, the opportunity to build lots more stuff than sprawl is going to even get accelerated on a scale that we've never even seen before. So you've got to have some governance and you've got to have some guardrails and get your head around this so that you don't make the mistakes of the past. You know, nobody wants another Lotus Notes where we have thousands of Lotus Notes sprawl throughout the company. <laughs> we don't know what they yeah. do or SharePoint hell. And every, you know, every department's got, you know, dozens of SharePoint sites and we don't know what they do. So my, my best advice to, to a customer in this is that you've got to have some gates. And at the front end of it, before you let somebody build something, you've got to have a front end gate that, that, that takes care of that ideation. You know, before, you know, you let somebody just go off and build something with a tool, 
you want to make sure you know what they're building, you know, from both a business and a technology standpoint. So mm -hmm. in service now, you know, we have our own low code citizen developer program. You know, we drink our own champagne. We practice what we preach. I'm, I'm a part of this program. But before we let anybody build something with App Engine, our low code tools, we just make sure a little, little check. It, it can be done in a few minutes, maybe a few hours. One, does the business want this being built? Two, technically, is it possible? And then three, does it exist elsewhere? Let's check our CMDB, our configuration management database. Let's see if this exists somewhere else in the organization because we don't want to take on technical debt. I'll be very honest with you. I've, I've tried to submit ideas mm -hmm. into this program. Hey, I got a really cool creator workflows mobile app I want to build. And I've been told, no, you know, Greg, we already, thanks, but no thanks. We have applications at the company that already do that. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the end of it, it's really good governance. They don't want me creating more technical debt. Yeah. But then we do another th check at the end, which is very important for our customers that are worried about sprawl and quality and, and, and having too many apps, is that before the app goes into production, we do a check. You know, we do a little bit of a health scan, some automated tests. We do a configuration review. We do a tech review so that we make sure that the application is of a certain quality before it goes into production. And this way, if the developer yeah. leaves tomorrow, it doesn't matter. It's been documented what the app does. We've run it through some tests so we know it's not going to fail and we're not just taking on debt for central IT to manage. And now it can go into production where you can monitor the business usage. Hey, you said a thousand people were going to use this on the front end. Hey, only 10 people are using it or the opposite. Maybe <laughs> yeah. 10,000 people are using it and we're getting more value out of it. But you, you can start to get a, a sense of that. And since it's on service now, we can register it as an asset. And we can register, as, register it as a configuration item in our CMDB where you can start to manage the app as an asset. Who's using it? What's the configuration? And if no one's using it, let's free up the licenses. Let's retire it. And so these are the ways that you know I recommend and ServiceNow is recommending you take a look at the sprawl and the, the, uh, the governance. So you do some checks on the beginning for the ideation to make sure you're not accruing more debt. And then you make sure you monitor yeah. in production, you manage it as an asset so that you could retire. So you don't wind up 10 years from now with a bunch of app engine apps sprawled throughout your company. These are the two major ways that ServiceNow is really helping customers avoid that sprawl and avoid that lack of governance so that you could run a report and know instantly what people are building. Yeah. And I don't want to mention any other competitive platforms. That's not the case with some other platforms. Yeah. I have access to some of these other platforms where I can build apps that my CIO never knows about. That's not a good thing. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. So many good nuggets for in, in there, Greg. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So you had mentioned this earlier, but from a perspective at ServiceNow, how do you see Gen, Gen AI evolving the SDLC and and the application development lifecycle? Where, where do you see that going? I, you know, I, I see it taking things beyond anybody's imagination. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really, really optimistic as, as somebody who's been building applications since I was in third grade and I went to computer camp and I built a, you know, a simple application to manage my baseball card collection. <laughs> you know, you see every few years we get more and more productive with what we can automate at the pace what which we can automate and the ideations of what we can do by making it much easier to write very sophisticated systems. And so I think a lot of developers are initially scared, like, oh my God, Gen AI, text to code, it's gonna replace me, you won't need a professional developer. See, but I look at it as just the opposite. It's gonna give me as a professional developer the ability to build sophisticated systems in an amount of time that we couldn't even imagine before, because it's gonna speed up the pace of this. Mm -hmm. And so I had to explain this to, to a customer a few weeks ago. And, you know, we're in there, we're pitching, we're talking about different things. And she's like, you know, time out. Like, I'm a business person. I don't even know what you mean by this, this Gen AI. Can you break it down for me? And I said, sure. So let's talk about a function called text to code where we're, you know, we're going to come to market now. And we're going to, when you go to write code on a service now platform at a code prompt here, we're going to make suggestions. You can write natural language and all of a sudden we will generate the code for you. Now, normally, if you were new to programming or even if you were an expert and you wanted to write code, you'd probably go to a code library you would develop where you have snippets, mm -hmm. or you'd go to a forum where you'd look up, hey, has anybody ever written a routine that does this? Or maybe you'd send it around an internal channel with other developers. Hey, I'm trying to do this. Does anybody know how to do that? Gen AI accelerates that, which could take a couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks, and it has it done in a couple of milliseconds. Mm -hmm. It will search all the code that's ever been written. And it will do it like that, give you the best code. 
So another big difference between ServiceNow's approach to Gen AI that I think is really important for, for all the people out there to really understand is that, you know, there's open models or general purpose, large language models like OpenAI and, and, and Microsoft Azure that are trained on all the data that's ever been out there in the ecosystem. Yeah. Now, we're taking a different approach. We're developing our own a large language learning models that are based on the data that we've curated that has been done on our instance. Mm -hmm. So our text to code looks at the code that we've written and that yeah. we think in our coding standards. And so we've even done some head to head comparisons before we rolled out text to code. We actually let our developers internally take it for a drive and they did some head to head comparisons with open AI. In our text to code, our recommendations were about 45% more accurate. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? Open AI is trained on all the code that's ever been written. There's a lot of bad code out there. You don't want to follow those best practices. Ours has been, you know, at a much higher standard. But we polled our developers initially and we asked them, how productive do you think you're going to be using text to code? And they thought maybe 10 to 20% effective. They're like, I'm still going to have to rewrite it. I'm not just going to take the recommendations that come from this code generator. At the end of this, they were about 50 to 70% more productive because the code recommendations were really good. Even our developers were like, damn, this is, this is really good. This is a nice, useful tool. So kind of where I see this all going is that it's going to allow the most productive and sophisticated developers to be that much more productive. They can build very sophisticated solutions very, very fast, not just writing the best code, but then using functions that we have coming out like text to process and text to app and, and text to flow to net, it's almost have the best business processes for doing this. You want to do a credit card fraud investigation process. Well, let's run it through ServiceNow's Gen AI and see how many times that's ever been done on the ServiceNow platform. And we can give you the best way to manage that process, then give you the best way to create the sub workflows of how to route that information. And then give you, if you have to write any code, we'll give you the absolute best code to actually do that. And mm -hmm. we're going to take all of this and put this all together, text to code and text to flow and text to UI and text to process and package it up as something called text to app. Mm -hmm. where now the promise of true citizen development and somebody somebody like uh, like my mother who doesn't know anything about application development can go into a prompt now and say, hey, I want to create an app that does X, Y, or Z and with some simple, very human language questions, be able to keep create a very sophisticated app very quickly. So things are changing and I don't think it's going to take the place of people. I think it's going to make people that much more productive. And they're going to be like society is going to be moving in a, in a very different motion so that maybe in four or five years, you're going to come to work and you're going to be expected to automate your job, not just do your job. That's not the central IT developer job. But mm -hmm. Using Gen AI is going to make it much easier and less training required to be able to do that automation that's required. And I always remember this quote from Steve Jobs that he talked about, like they did a study of all the fastest animals on earth. And I think human beings were like 14. I think that, you know, the condor was up there, you know, just using their natural abilities. But they did something very interesting in the study. They're like, well, let's, let's measure how, how fast a human being could be on a bicycle. And then it became the fastest human being on earth. Mm -hmm. It became the fastest animal. So with these tools, they actually enhance and make people that much more productive. And Gen AI now is, is, is taking all the existing tools out there and going to make human beings, developers, way more productive than they've ever been in the history of you know, anything. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, we're, we're starting to see in what I've used it, uh, an analogy that it's an assistant. It gets us to something quicker. Just know how to manage it, know how to model it, figure out what it is, and use it to your advantage. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something to help no. you be, you use the term more productive, and I love that, is being yep. more productive, and I'm getting rid of some of the learning gaps and stuff, and I can learn from what this is doing and build it from there. I love it. Yeah, um, yeah. no, it's it's a very exciting time, and uh, yeah. I couldn't be more, I'm like a kid in a candy store. This is great, so. Yeah, and, and your excitement shows. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so a, a lot of, the next thing I want to get into is it seems like a lot of people know ServiceNow for verticals and domain specific products. It really seems like there's less awareness about App Engine capability. It's still really untapped. Um, and I wanted to see if you could talk about, you know, the roadmap for creative workflows and App Engine and where it's going. I, I know that we've got, you know, there's different webinars and sometimes people get exposed to this and don't and our listeners and viewers yeah. might not know. So I thought I'd give you the platform to talk about the stuff that's exciting you and service down yeah. and what's coming down the line. 
Yeah, I mean, I think some of this has to do with with some of the the myths that are out there, and I and I and part of what I do is I do a lot of myth busting when I go out there, and you know, like, uh, you know, a lot of times it's it's well, I have to make a decision whether or not I want to buy versus build. That's usually a very big decision. CIOs and business leaders say, oh, I'll either buy it or I'll build it. And I always like to quote one of our customers, Intercontinental Exchange, ICE, or the New York Stock Exchange. You know, they always said very distinctly, like with ServiceNow, it's not buy versus build, it's buy to build. Mm -hmm. Where when you buy into ServiceNow as a technology, you get the best in class pre-built workflow products for, for IT service management, for customer service management, for human resources, you know, uh, case management. We give you the best tools, pre-built workflows in all of those areas, but then we also give you access to our core platform with our app engine that we've used to build all those tools. But now you can use our same app engine tools to build your own applications. So you get the best of both worlds. You know, I think for a long time, there were some really bad best practices on the ServiceNow platform. So people wanted to stay away from building apps because mm -hmm. it would hose your instance. We saw that problem <laughs> yeah. six, seven years ago. Like now, when you build applications or you extend any of our core applications, you don't have to buy an SDK to do it you can naturally use the app engine and we do it in something called a scope. And so for all the ServiceNow techies out there watching this list, they all know what scoped apps are, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe for the business person, what the heck is a scoped app? Well, you want to know what a scoped app is. I'll tell you what a scoped app is. You just literally pick up your iPhone and you look at all these things right up here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are all scopes. Right. Every app on your phone, it doesn't bring down the whole, it doesn't crash your phone when you upgrade to the next version of, uh, of the Mac OS or the Android OS. Your phone doesn't get hosed because each app on your phone is isolated in its own scope where it's protected and it can't bring down the entire phone or the entire instance. Now, with ServiceNow and App Engine, it's the same concept. When you do a custom app or you do a customization where you add on to an existing app, I call it personalization, not customization, it's in its scope. So it's protected, so it doesn't bring it down. And so now people are starting to, to, to learn this, that wow, with ServiceNow, I actually get both. I get the ability to, to, to buy prepackaged workflows, but yet I get the ability to build my own custom workflows. Because the one thing that I will challenge when I hear a business leader say this, I, I don't wanna do any customization, no building, everything out of the box. My first reaction is really, your business is so generic, that you can run it with with all out of the box workflow products. Yeah. That, wow, that sounds like a business model I could probably replicate pretty easily. Then there's nothing specific or you know uh, or unique about your business. Um, and then the first thing I, I say that well, since you're doing no customization, I'm going to turn off all the scripting controls on your instance. Oh, wait a second, no, mm -hmm. no, 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 my my guys need that. Well, wait, I thought they use it out of the box. What are all these custom scripts they have all over the place? And then you kind of dig into it. But another area that I've, I've discovered with CIOs around, you know, that customization versus, you know, uh, buy versus build is that they are doing custom development and they have customization all over their entire company. Guess where it's being done? In email inboxes and spreadsheets, mm. right? They're yeah, like, well, totally. I can't do it in yeah. service now or you can't do it in this product. So people are doing all these custom things on a daily basis. They're just doing them in tools that you have no insight into and that you can't manage and you can't scale. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you start to see this, and that's even where a lot of CIOs will start. I know that our CIO, Chris Betty, when he first came to ServiceNow, those were the first applications and the first customizations that he put into our company service portal. He's like, let me pull the exchange server for all the email alias inboxes where people are sending requests to. Those are going to now be services and custom app engine services we build into our portal. Awesome. But kind of moving forward, where are we really taking things in our roadmap? Um, we see a lot more building on the platform. We see a lot more people starting to standardize this and really take this on and really empower two different groups, you know, empowering, you know, partners like such as Cask and the central IT developers, you know, within IT, the really comprehensive people. And they need very, very professional grade tools to accelerate their very sophisticated development, you know, source control, routing, a lot of text to code in those different areas. But at the same time, we see these citizen developers emerging, you know, the shadow IT developers that need to be very abstract and they need very, very, very simple tools. So we're going to be launching two sets of products next year, both a creator studio that is really targeted at that citizen developer who doesn't know anything about applications mm -hmm. and just needs to, you know, really just kind of quickly build an automation or a workflow without writing a lot of code, but do that safely within the guardrails. 
And at the same time, we're going to be reimagining our classic studio and our app engine studio as something called developer studio, which brings together all of the most comprehensive tools on the ServiceNow platform to build sophisticated custom apps and puts them into one consolidated system called developer studio. That's going to make developers leap. Their hearts are going to go out of their chest and be more productive than they've ever been. And so we're really making sure that we're meeting our development community where they are because we really see this proliferating over the next few years with Gen AI. You're mm -hmm. going to start to see developers, professional developers have a much greater demand on them to build sophisticated systems. And so they're going to need more sophisticated tools aided by Gen AI. And we are focusing that that is a super priority of us. But at the same time, you know, if you believe what Gardner's saying, 750 million new apps are going to be built over the next three years, which is, which is more apps than have been built in the last 40 <laughs> years. Yeah. You can't hire your way out of this problem. There's not enough developers. So companies have to open their pool of developers and they're going to need these citizen developer friendly tools. And you see a lot of these niche players like the air tables and the bubbles and the uncorks, you know, coming out with all these tools, but they're not really enterprise grade and they're not really scalable. So we see this big opportunity to launch this creator studio where we're going to start to empower a lot of these line of business developers. So they need very low entry tools or very, you know, very easy to use tools where the barrier of entry is very low, but they still want to do it on a scalable platform like ServiceNow where it can be governed and managed so that the CIO can still see what's going on. So you're going to start to see ServiceNow really double down on both of these areas. And then finally, really doubling down on App Engine Management Center, which is our governance tools to really start to use Gen AI to really even help more and more with the governance around what should you be building? How should you be building it? How should you manage the sprawl and start to bring things together? Somebody has an idea to build an app and now start to use generative AI to make suggestions. Hey, I've seen parts of that app built elsewhere. Let me help you do that. So I think you're gonna see service now, the innovation coming out over the next 18 months from this company just blow people's mind and put to bed once and for all whether or not ServiceNow is an application development platform. Yeah. That, that there's so much there to break down, but I, as you were talking, something that kind of came up in my head was, you know, we talk, you know, really big, but I'm thinking about what about those smaller customers of ServiceNow and those that we're working with that are, might find this overwhelming. What would you say to them? Like, what if they think, oh, gosh, I'm too small to do that. What, and you kind of started talking about it with the creator tools and the low code tools that are geared towards the smaller organizations. But what would you want to share with a, maybe an organization that goes, gosh, I'm a, I'm a two person, you know, I've got me yeah. and someone else. What would you say to them about App Engine and what to be looking at? I would say that most customers start out very small. I would say a lot of customers usually either start with one of our prepackaged workflows, ITSM usually, or CSM or HRSD, yep. and they just start out by maybe extending it, you know, very small and kind of getting in their feet, their feet wet, or, you know, just, hey, I have got a business need or a business user over here. And our smaller commercial customer, they, even in law firms, I've seen are some of the biggest proponents of this here. Mm -hmm because they have the most limited budgets, they have the limited staff, so they really have to maximize the productivity. They don't have a lot of room for fluff and they can't take a lot of these tools that come off as free and where they're spending yeah. an, an exorbitant amount of time trying to, to automate things. And so with those smaller companies, I would say, you know, look at the type of things that you're trying to automate and what it may be a, a best fit for it. When you start to break down you know, what ServiceNow is actually good at. And, and I heard this, you know, and I'll, and I'll be a little cheeky with this a couple of years ago from an ex-CEO. He's like, well, I get it. Service, uh, Salesforce is for sales, but ServiceNow is for work. And I just thought that was such an <laughs> apropos way to look at it. It's yeah. true. And what is work really? The majority of the things that happen in an organization that are considered work is, hey, can you take a look at this? Can you take a look at this? I need a couple of people to review this. Mm -hmm. Those are workflows and approvals and tasks. Yeah. That's the core architecture of the ServiceNow platform workflows, yeah. requests, approvals, and tasks. The majority of the work that gets done in business is having people just look at stuff and approve stuff and then actually go ahead and commit stuff. And that's like nine out of 10 times what people are using email and spreadsheets. I'll create a spreadsheet with a list of stuff people have to look at and, and review it. And I'll email it around like a ping pong ball. Those are all the type of applications that ServiceNow can help automate with. 
and mm-hmm. do it very, very quickly. And it's not going to take you days and days and weeks and you got to go contract out a big uh, developer to do it. Those are the type of things that can be done very, very rapidly. So those smaller companies, you don't have to go in and, and boil the ocean, set up a giant program. I would say get small, you know, get started with maybe some of the painful things and and start to kind of little by little build up a groundswell. You know, the, 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 there's an evolution to this. And, you know, where where do you start? You know, I get to ask this question from CIOs on a weekly basis, Greg, where should I get started? And I'm like, well, listen, you know, people spend about 10 times more on painkillers than they do on vitamins. So if you want to help people (laughs) take away their pain, right? More than they want to build muscles, they want to take care of their pain. So every employee at your company has got stuff that's painful about their job. Every single one from the CEO all the way down to somebody in the mailroom. If you want to help them and you want to bring them along for the ride, and they want to make it so that you're not just giving them more work to do, take away their pain. And that's how you get people to start to buy into a lot of the stuff. That's awesome. You actually addressed the next question. And one of the last that I was going to ask you about was how do customers actually get started? So instead of talking about the little, you you know, what you just described is kind of the stepping stones, find out what people's pain is and get to the core of it. But let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, we, we've got now learning and things like that. Is there anything yeah. you recommend for people to start watching and looking at yeah. or, as far as the service now resource? How do we actually get started? Something that they could take away and go, let me go look at this part of ServiceNow's website or whatever. Any recommendations there? Yeah. I mean, I would, I would go to developer.servicenow.com mm. right now. You yeah. go on there. If you don't have an account, get a free instance. And you can start building out. There's tons of free learning paths. You want to learn how to use App Engine Studio. You want to learn how to create a simple request form. You want to learn how to build an integration. We have a spoke designer now. You can start building stuff immediately. You don't have to wait. But if you'd rather have a more guided experience, head on over to lowcodeworkshops.com. We have a list of workshops we have in every major city almost every other week where you can come out where you have partners like CAS working with ServiceNow's creative workflows teams. We take you through a guided classroom experience. You know, we kind of make it fun. We show you how to build some apps. We build some, some hackathons and, you know, we give out prizes and you kind of do it in a, in a group setting. But you don't have to wait. You can get started immediately and get out there and see all kinds of code samples. Like get on YouTube.com. There's all kinds of examples of how people have built apps very, very quickly. There's a huge community out there. And so, so I wouldn't wait. I mean, I'd start with developer.servicenow.com, you know, go to our public website, you know, create a workflows. There's tons of examples out there and, and, and short little videos that show you how to build applications. But I wouldn't wait. You don't have to wait to, to go to your IT help desk or get somebody to give you access to this. You can go right now to developer.servicenow.com, get an instance, get plugged in and start um, showing some people you work with, hey, look what I built in my developer instance. And you will get ServiceNow owners going, hmm, we could use that internally. Why don't you bring this on over? And yeah. uh, you know, you, you'll become a big star really, really quickly inside your company. That's such good advice. It's basically go build, go try it out, go go wreck it in a PDI, of yeah. course. <laughs> you know? Well, exactly. Yeah. Do, do it in a sub environment. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I wanted to open up one, one last question for you would be, sure. I always like to ask this is, is there anything else you'd like to share with Cast Distillery's audience on anything that we missed or anything you'd like to, to close out with? I, I would just say that, you know, really what sets ServiceNow apart in this area, you know, we go back to the original question, oh my God, you know, it's the help desk platform is that there's a lot of low code players and there's a lot of tools out there to build low code apps and to do automation. It can almost get overwhelming at times. Like, oh my God, there's so many choices. I don't know. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go with this one. Um, but the biggest mistake that I I see people make and CIOs make and leaders make and business leaders make is that they make a big investment in the technology monetarily wise. And so they wind up putting everything into that bucket, whether or not that makes sense or not. You know, service now is not always going to be the best answer. But you know what? We take a very kind of hyper automation, holistic approach to this, that we want you to use the right solution to solve the right problem. So on the ServiceNow platform, yes, we have low code apps. We have prepackaged apps. We've got RPA to do bots. We have integrations. We have document intelligence. There's so many different ways that you can automate a problem. But with ServiceNow, we always make the recommendation to solve the right problem with the right solution so you can get the most out of it. And I think finally, the biggest thing that sets us apart, 
is that we look at low code as a team sport where most companies kind of look at low code as just an individual stuff, you know, just here's tools to build lots of stuff fast. So what I mean by team sport, it's the person building the automation, the low code developer working with the operational teams to manage it in a paradigm so it doesn't create spawns, it's secure and it's reliable. And let's not forget about the end user, right? The final person in the team sport, you know, how many apps, Sean, do you get pushed out to your cell phone a week? And you don't take a three week training class to learn how to use them, right? You True. just open them up and you start yeah. using them. So these low code apps have to be just as user friendly and just as, 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 as intuitive. And ServiceNow is really a very unique platform is that we take care of the creators with tools. We take care of the operational teams that have to manage and have to safely scale and deploy it. And we take care of the end users because anybody uses ServiceNow, whenever you talk to somebody who has been an end user of ServiceNow, what's the first reaction? Love ServiceNow because it just works. So that would be kind of my takeaway on this here. The, my, my last piece of advice, when you start to think about ServiceNow, look at it very differently. It's a team sport where I can use the right technologies from this platform to solve the right problems and not waste any time or money. That's awesome. So Craig, th thank you so much for taking time out and talking to hey, us today. Pleasure. It's truly appreciated. We know how busy you are. Uh, and one <laughs> last thing for our audience is just please, as you're watching these, like, share, however you're watching this or consuming this, uh, rate it. It helps the agro algorithm push this out to more people and to benefit more people. And the last thing I want to talk about in regards to creator workflows is Cask actually just created something called the Cask Create App Assessor. So it allows us to kind of get an idea of, you know, what is the effort going to be for you to do something like this? So we'll put a link in the, uh, in the show notes for this for you to take a look at this. And for now, take care. Have a great one. Bye-bye.